So welcome to this, in many respects, a very solemn occasion. We're commemorating the 30th anniversary of what many would say is the worst <clears throat> nuclear power accident the world has ever seen. It took place 30 years ago in the wee hours of April 26 and 1986. The, all, the, all, uh, the rest of us have been uh, kind of immersed in this issue, especially Chernobyl, over a variety of, of years or decades in the case of uh, the colleagues to my immediate right and left, and John as well. And I'll just briefly introduce him later. But I also want to also thank uh, Dr. Milton Honig, sitting here in the front row, longtime FAS member, and Ed's a longtime FAS member. And about two months ago, wasn't that long ago, I thought, well, maybe we should do something. The anniversary's coming up soon. If we're going to do it, we got a plan soon. Milton contacted me. We hadn't met in a while and said, let's have coffee. So we went to a nice cafe. And I said, what do you think about doing this event? After about an hour brainstorming, we came up with a, a number of people who could be good speakers, and a couple of them were sitting at the panel right now. So thank you, Milton, for your advice. And then we had to come up with a theme or a title for the event. And I'm to blame for this title. I say to blame because uh, I put it out there to uh, a few of our speakers, and there was some debate, internal debate, a lot of emails back and forth, and I, I won't say who ha was on what side of the debate, but some were saying, is there really any meaning for today about Chernobyl? It seemed obvious to me, but maybe I was missing something, and some would say, well, maybe there's not much meaning for nuclear power, because we don't have that many RBMK-type reactors, except in Russia still operating. We'll get to that later. But I think there are larger meanings, and I think all of our speakers will, will talk to a variety of meanings. And then this morning, I was reminded of the concept of the will to meaning, reading the New York Times, and there was a piece, and it said, Dr. Viktor Frankl, as many of you know, was a renowned psychiatrist and the author of Man's Search for Meaning, He's also a survivor of uh, the Holocaust, Auschwitz. And Frankel, in the face of horrendous events, uh, found meaning in his life, found purpose in life. He rose to the occasion, but others, you know, others did not. And, um, and then I was also reminded in today's times, reading the obituary of Dr. Walter Cohn. Uh, Dr. Cohn, Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. He'd also been on the Federation of American Scientists Board of Sponsors for many years. He was a strong advocate for nuclear arms control. So Dr. Cohn, I found out, uh, he made it out of Europe less than one month before the start of the war. And he was part of the, um, the kinder transport. His parents got him and his sister out of Europe in time uh, well, like the, the Nazi-controlled part of Europe, they made it to England. They eventually deported to Canada because they were enemy aliens, they had German passports. So anyway, the point is that Dr. Cohn made a tremendous amount of meaning in his life. Unfortunately, his parents were sent to Auschwitz and they were murdered. And I'm not trying to make a direct connection between Chernobyl and the Holocaust. Uh, they're both in you know, scales, both you know, different types of events. But I do think there are two common lessons to those two events. One is uh, never forget. We should always remember these two events, and so that's part of the role we have today. And two is that we need to be ever vigilant to prevent further catastrophes, especially caused by human villainy or vanity. And today, we'll really talk about vanity or arrogance or hubris, however you want to describe it, and why, these, why this event happened 30 years ago. Uh, so with that, um, I gave a little bit of introduction to Ed. We're going to have Ed go first, because he'll walk us through a lot of what happened that day 30 years ago. And then his uh, final slides will get into the meaning for him for today. Then we'll then turn to uh, John Johnson, because John uh, has a distinguished career, U.S. Nuclear Navy, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, a senior executive for many years, 
now senior vice president, Lightbridge Company, and uh, John is trained as a nuclear engineer. So he, he has a lot of common slides, a lot of common materials. Ed, he can skip through a lot of that to save time, get to the regulatory issues toward the end of his, his uh, presentation. And then we'll go to uh, uh, Carol Kessler. Carol will talk to the meanings of the political and the economic and development side in Europe, and also regulations as well. Carol has a tremendously long distinguished career in nuclear safety, non-proliferation, nuclear security matters, and uh, has you know, two master's degree, one from the National War College. And then last but certainly not least, Dr. Maureen Hatch, an epidemiologist uh, from the National Cancer Institute, former head of the Chernobyl Research Institute, and she, she will talk about the health effects. So we're gonna end on a fairly controversial note, but I'm hoping Maureen will, will shed a lot of light on that particular issue and then we'll go to Q&A. So, uh, Ed, the uh, floor is yours. Can I do these standing? Oh, if whatever you prefer. Yeah. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm speaking about dysfunctional decisions relating to arising from Chernobyl. And the uh, first dysfunctional decision is that this reactor should not have been built. Uh, the reactor was designed for production of plutonium for bombs, and it uh, was uh, decided early on by those who uh, had uh, power in the Soviet Union uh, to use this type of reactor for uh, civilian use. Uh, it was a white water reactor, graphite moderated, uh, with 2% enriched uranium, <coughs> and um, the uh, uh, control rod, the uh, uh, fuel rods, uh, numbered 1,600, and that was part of the plutonium optimization. These uh, 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 fuel assemblies could be taken out individually by a crane on top. The uh, reactor had two major design flaws. One was that it had no containment uh, construction around it, and this was partly a result of the fact that this type of reactor had been used in the Soviet Union in the 1970s. This reactor opened in 1983, and during the 70s, they did not have any overwhelming problems with it, and they had a false sense of uh, confidence. The uh, second major design flaw, and the one that proved fatal, to uh, the reactor is that as early as the mid-60s, scientists in the Soviet Union recognized that with this design, there was water flowing through the fuel assemblies, that if the water were overheated, steam bubbles would form, creating voids that allowed additional neutron flow and more fission, creating more heat creating more steam bubbles. And this is a positive feedback loop which can be, get easily out of control, and it did. That critique from the 60s uh, was ignored, and it was suppressed. Uh, the uh, reactor went online December 20th, 1983, two days before people in this nuclear industry receive awards and bonuses for their good work. By going online on that day, they uh, completed the work ahead of schedule. But in doing so, they skipped doing a very important uh, safety um, uh, test. The reactor uh, was vulnerable in the following way. If there were a power failure in the region, uh, the electricity for the pumps that uh, cooled the fuel rods uh, would go down. And uh, within a minute, emergency uh, generators would provide the electricity for the cooling. So they had one minute where there would be no electricity, and they were trying to gin up a, um, an electrical uh, system that would cover that one minute. And they didn't test it uh, prior to opening uh, the, uh, 
uh, the system. Now, before going to the accident itself, I want to comment on uh, what was uh, eventually called a lack of safety culture in the Soviet Union concerning uh, nuclear development. And there are several examples of, uh, of this lack of safety culture. One is that next to uh, Chernobyl and Fukushima, the largest nuclear accident, the largest accident relating to nuclear power in history, and very close to uh, the magnitude of Fukushima and, uh, and Chernobyl, was an event in 1957 in the Urals in a place called Kishtum, where the Soviets had been developing nuclear weapons and had large waste disposal areas, waste storage areas, and in one of those waste storages, it's not a nuclear reactor that blew up, but a chemical explosion in the uh, waste containment area, but it was huge. And it required the evacuation of more than 10,000 people, and it contaminated an area larger than New York City. Uh, how many deaths there were, we don't know. But this accident, uh, which didn't release radioactivity to neighboring countries, uh, they were able to keep that secret for 32 years, until 1989. As a result, people working in the nuclear industry in uh, the Soviet Union did not have the opportunity to learn about uh, radiation and its effects and fallout and all the related issues uh, that were pertinent to that event. Um, and then, in the 1970s, there were a number of Chernobyl-type reactors with these uh, graphite moderating uh, structures and uh, separate fuel rods. Uh, there were a number of them operating that had accidents of various types, uh, small explosions, fires, shutdowns, but they didn't report or discuss them with the outside world or with the inside world, so that people working in the industry, uh, and especially the operators and managers of nuclear fuel uh, plants, couldn't learn from this experience. So, uh, after opening the uh, reactor in 1983, there was an attempt to test this uh, emergency electrical uh, system in 1984, which failed, in 1985, which failed, and so people were very nervous about it. There were a lot of people, apparently at high levels, who didn't even know there was a problem at uh, Chernobyl. And by the way, Chernobyl, this was the fourth reactor of its type at Chernobyl. There were already three operating and there were at least two more planned. This would have been the largest concentration of nuclear power plants in the world. So they, there was great pressure to uh, get this test done. And uh, unfortunately, when they arrived at the time uh, to do the test, uh, the reactor had been in operation for quite a while. And the uh, fuel uh, containers um, had been uh, operating and producing radioactive material. So it was kind of optimized for concentration of radioactive materials. It's the worst possible time uh, for such a test of such a disaster. And the test was not coordinated fully by those involved. And the test was scheduled during the daytime of April 25th. But because of issues with the regional power agency, they were asked to postpone it. So it didn't start it until near midnight, at which time the, uh, the teams of operators had changed. So the nighttime chief the team was not as well prepared. They didn't really know what they were getting into. They didn't understand a lot of the factors involved. And so um, the uh, test was actually started after midnight on the 26th. And in the first instance, they needed to lower the power level of the reactor, but they lowered it too much. 
and there were nuclear reactions that kicked in at this low power level, which impeded further operation of the reactor, uh, and they should have stopped the test at that time. They did not. That was one of many mistakes that were made. I'll only mention a couple. Um, the operators didn't understand the nature of the nuclear reactions that would inhibit lifting the power level. And uh, they tried to raise the power level. They took out lots of control rods. They shut off emergency systems. Uh, a number of these were very big mistakes. And eventually, the boiling point positive feedback kicked in. And they tried to shut down uh, the reactor. Uh, and they had all the control rods inserted, not realizing that these control rod designs were also defective. And when the first tip of the control rod goes in, it actually increases the power levels. So the whole thing went kaput. And, um, and what happened was, very quickly, there was a steam explosion, followed by, I, I, I believe the consensus is that it was a hydrogen uh, explosion, not a nuclear explosion. But uh, as the fuel rods melted, the uh, titanium uh, containers for the fuel oxidized, and in the oxidation process produced uh, hydrogen, and so we had a huge steam explosion followed by a hydrogen explosion. The explosion took place at 1.23 a.m. on April 26th. It was a 2,000 ton cover of the reactor. There was no container vessel, but they did have this very um, massive cover, and it was blown off. If you see pictures of this, uh, you see it lying. <laughs> well, it becomes vertical and, and broken. Uh, graphite. Uh, it, it, it is carbon, which, which burns. And there was a, a very significant uh, graphite uh, uh, fire that was initiated, and this structure was largely made of uh, graphite. Uh, a lot of radioactive material, and some uranium, some plutonium, um, blew out of, of the reactor, and the fire went on for some time before they could stop it. And it, it uh, brought radioactive material to a large region because during that two weeks or so afterwards, the weather patterns were moving in all different directions. Well, initially, the Soviets tried to keep this secret. It's not easy to keep that secret. Mm -hmm. And uh, on uh, uh, April uh, 28th, workers at a power plant in Sweden uh, thought that they had a problem at their power plant because they were measuring a lot of radioactivity and they realized this was coming from someplace else. They were able to analyze some of the particles that were coming through to Sweden and they saw there were isotopes that would only be, would only exist in a melted down nuclear reactor. So they were able to determine that a, a reactor had failed seriously in the Ukraine, and they confronted the Soviets. So the Soviets had to admit that there was an accident on, at 9 o'clock on the 28th of April. Uh, there was a report on Moscow television, and they said, a very simple report, and they said, there has been an accident, uh, and, and essentially we're taking care of it. Uh, actions are being taken to, quote, eliminate the consequences. Not likely. Um, after the uh, uh, explosion, uh, lots of other defects in decision making became uh, uh, apparent. Uh, most tragically, the firefighters and other uh, initial responders didn't know what was the, what they were getting into. They didn't understand radioactivity. They didn't have instrumentation to measure the radioactivity. Uh, they didn't have protective clothing, and so uh, firefighters, the death rate among the firefighters was uh, very, very high. Uh, nearby Chernobyl uh, is a town uh, 
Pripyat, you see lots of pictures of Pripyat in the newspapers on television today. And uh, the, there are 50,000 people living there. Initially, they were not told that there had been um, a serious re uh, reactor explosion with radioactivity uh, falling heavily in the region. And so uh, on the day, on the 26th, uh, they went about their business as usual. Weddings were held, children were playing outside. That should not have happened. Uh, they were finally evacuated. The entire town was evacuated uh, starting at 2 p.m. Um, on the 28th. They had 1,000 buses come. So they evacuated the town very efficiently. Um, in Kiev, uh, which is just 63 miles uh, from Chernobyl, uh, at, at that time, and it's probably still today, it was the eighth largest city in Europe with a population of uh, two and a half million people. And they were not alerted to the problem. And they went about their business as usual. And in fact, in Kiev and other cities uh, in the Ukraine and Russia, uh, May Day was celebrated as usual. Uh, that should never have happened. Children of Kiev were not evacuated until mid-May. Uh, the world uh, was uh, quite agitated about this accident. It was well known everywhere. And the IAEA was um, under pressure to come up with answers they, uh, and information. They held an international conference in August of uh, 1986, and the presentation from the Soviet Union was made by academician uh, Valery Lebesov, who had been instrumental in helping ameliorate the issues uh, at the reactor and in the region, and he presented um, a, a report, but he held to the um, decision of the Politburo that the entire event was due to operator failure. Managers and operators at the reactor had failed their duty. And so he, um, he made, that was the core of his uh, presentation, but not long after he regretted what he had done, he became depressed. And he, um, after a year or so, he just started writing his memoirs. And on the second anniversary, of Chernobyl, he was found hanging in the hallway of uh, his um, apartment house. Real information about Chernobyl started to uh, come out, and in 1992, the IAEA held another conference about Chernobyl, and uh, one of the comments in the uh, report that uh, was issued at that time was that the USSR lacked a culture of safety. In keeping with the idea that everything that went wrong was due to the actions of the people managing and working at the plant itself, a show trial was held in, in July of 1987, and six individuals, managers and operators, were put on trial and sentenced to between two and 10 years in corrective uh, labor camps. They were charged with negligence and irresponsibility and many other um, bad things. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this was the last show trial in the uh, Soviet Union. And today, uh, <laughs> we see that uh, after Chernobyl, uh, the three other reactors at that location were closed down, but it took a while to do that. It wasn't until 1991, 1996, and 2000 that the other three reactors were closed down. This is a unique design. It was only uh, in the Soviet <coughs> Union, but also the Soviet Union had built two of these in Lithuania, and Lithuania was not allowed to have uh, access accession to the European Union unless they closed their Chernobyl-type reactors, which they did with a lot of outside assistance, financially and technically, in 2000 and 2009. Now, uh, as uh, Charles kindly pointed out, 
Uh, I'm the one on the panel who's known the least about all of this, and a lot of this has been very surprising to me, but I can say that, uh, that probably the biggest surprise of all was to discover that there are 11 Chernobyl reactors operating today in the uh, Russian uh, Federation. Um, uh, Russia says that these have been modified and enhanced and <coughs> they're, not as, they're, they're safer than they were. Uh, but uh, in conversations uh, with various uh, experienced people and nuclear engineers, uh, it's clear that this type of reactor would not be allowed in the West today, in Western Europe or the United States. Uh, closing them would be economically difficult for the Soviet Union or before the Russian Federation because they provide one third of all the nuclear electric power in Russia today. Uh, it's uh, my view that the IAEA should ask for uh, visits and analysis of the safety of uh, these 11 uh, nuclear reactors today. Thank you very much. And I'm, I want you to know that Ed and I did not collaborate, but I, I have a few of the same points in my slides, but I'll try to go over them quickly. I work for Lightbridge Corporation. It's a small pri uh, publicly traded company, Truth in Advertising. I did start my career in the U.S. Navy, and I'm a nuclear engineer. <clears throat> and I uh, retired from the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, so I had a long career with uh, the NRC. I was a new inspector and received a phone call one day at the NRC and it was the shift supervisor reporting the accident at Three Mile Island and after asking him a few questions I was just walking through the control room and I mean the uh, conference room and the phone was ringing. I asked him a few questions and told him he had better things to do and shortly thereafter so I know quite a bit of the lessons learned from that too. <coughs> um, at Lightbridge is a nuclear engineering company in uh, Northern Virginia, and we're designing an advanced nuclear fuel that has safety benefits, and we also do nuclear safety consulting. I'll talk a little bit about the accident, but I'll go over it quickly because Ed has gone through a lot of the details. I'll talk about the design and safety analysis. I'll focus on operations and emergency response. And then I want to talk about what it means today because we have a lot of new design, new reactor designs being uh, conceived of today. Ed said the Soviet Union had a lot of experience with high power graphite reactors and as he said, uh, when they were on, they could refuel online and pull out the fuel assemblies with the right concentration of plutonium for weapons. Uh, there's only another, uh, not to We'll label the Canadian design, but the can-do reactors also can do online refueling. Uh, Chernobyl, the station, the operators had basically trouble-free operations. And they became complacent. They were good operators. They were known as good operators. The reactor core was very big. I uh, use the term loosely coupled because it's possible that you could be controlling one part of the reactor, you could be shutting down one part of the reactor core, and the other part of the reactor core could be increasing in power. It was so large. And again, the reactor had a confinement that was only capable of protecting a small loss of coolant accident. <clears throat> okay, I'll just summarize. Early in the morning, on the mid-shift, a group of well-intentioned operators, they had good intentions. They conducted a test to demonstrate the relationship of certain plant parameters. The shift supervisor had approved the test, although he and the operators didn't really understand all the design basis of the system. The operators allowed the plant to be operated in an unacceptable region of safety. The test was not evaluated or approved by a safety design group. Usually at a station, there's a, a group of people that all they do is focus on safety, not production, 
or maintenance, but they review new things. And this was test wasn't approved by that group. And the operators were in a rush. They had a sense of urgency to do this test. And this was Chernobyl 30 years ago, right? No. That was a description of a US nuclear power plant in 1994, eight years after Chernobyl. That description I wrote, I was involved with that nuclear power plant. So did, did those operators at that power plant learn their lessons eight years later? No. So like Ed said, there were design problems, there was management problems, but there was also operational problems. Well-intentioned people conducted a test with a procedure that wasn't approved, they didn't understand what they were doing, and they were in a rush. Can that happen again? Sure. I hope not. I think in the U.S., my understanding is uh, management now understands a lot of these things and operations are much safer today. <clears throat> I won't go through uh, this. The second paragraph just summarizes the cause. It's considered to be a combination of deficient characteristics of the reactor, the control rod system, and improper actions by operators. The operators were not reckless. They were well-intentioned, they weren't reckless. They were trying to do the right thing, but they were part of a big problem with safety culture. Okay, this is a picture of the Chernobyl control room. You can see it was a very large plant, lots of spread out gauges. And as Ed said, they started the test on the 25th, so that was yesterday. <laughs> And uh, they had to hold for almost a day because the power, the grid operator needed the electricity, so they, they delayed it, and it, that caused more problems. The, like I said, the test procedure didn't have an adequate safety review. Even so, the procedure they had, they didn't follow. The operators bypassed the safety systems. The positions of the control rods, they had a lot of control rods. They, they didn't meet their requirements and it was a sense of urgency. The reason it was a sense of urgency is because they were getting ready to shut down for a refueling outage. And then when they were done with that, they'd be starting back up again and they'd operate for an entire cycle. And this test could only be done on the shutdown. So if they didn't do it now, the test wouldn't be done for another year and a half or two years. That, that operating cycle sounds familiar to me. That's what our power plants do. They operate pretty much for a whole cycle and then shut down. <clears throat> Two things on this diagram. The, the blue and brown drawing on the left, I've tried to depict a control rod, a vertical control rod. And the brown is the poison, which is the controlling, it will control the power level. And when the rods were inserted, the blue section was basically uh, neutral. It, it would displace water. And so the control rod had to go in very far before it actually started to take effect. So even when they started to insert the control rods, detecting a, a serious problem, it actually made things worse because it displaced water and it added positive reactivity. We would never allow that type of control rod system in the US. Our control rods go in very quickly. These were very slow. Why were they slow? If they didn't have to, they didn't want to shut the reactor down. They wanted to keep it running all the time. So if there was a little glitch, they just wanted a slow reduction in power and the control rods only move slowly. They also, this power coefficient, positive power coefficient that Ed mentioned, is very serious. If you start heating up the reactor, the higher temperature and higher power causes more higher temperature and more power instead of the opposite effect. All the 
the, the Navy reactors and the, all the basic reactors in this country have a negative temperature coefficient, a negative power coefficient. So it's more self-controlling. If you start, if our reactors start to go up in power, they will heat up the fuel, which will cause a negative reactivity and tend to shut the reactor down. This uh, was just the opposite. This is a graph of the power versus time. So when the accident, when the shutdown started here, the operators brought power down, but the grid operator held it constant for half a day. And then this is the next day here. So as Ed mentioned, you've got another group of operators in the middle of the night that aren't familiar with this starting, starting the shutdown now. They got down into this area here. The control rods were in the bad positions and they started, they started inserting the rods and did the test here. And as you can see, they very quickly, in a very short amount of time, caused this high, basically, a burst of the fuel assemblies and caused the, the uh, basically, it was a, a more of a, a power explosion that blew the top off. Uh, it's, it's called going prompt critical. They added so much positive reactivity, uh, they couldn't control it at all. So this is what I just tried to explain. The rapidly expanding fission gas, there's gas inside the uh, gas inside the fuel. Part of the fission products are gaseous. So they, they rapidly expanded and ruptured the cladding and, and basically uh, blew the core, the graphite, and the fuel up onto the roof and, and out of the place. And uh, graphite was on fire and the building was on fire. Uh, Helicopters were used to drop boron and sand. Boron is a good poison to shut a plant down. Our, our plants use uh, emergency boration in the reactors to, to uh, be a, a, a neutron controller. And sand was dropped from the air. And of course, eventually a sarcophagus is the name of a, a shelter to put over the top of it. Uh, there were some accident changes uh, after the accident to the RMB, RBMKs, as Ed mentioned. Uh, they did a lot of work to provide more indication in the control room of where the control rods were. Some management activities to prevent safety systems from being bypassed. And they did take some actions to solve this positive void coefficient of reactivity which was very serious. They added some uh, boron absorbers. They, they uh, increased control rods and they increased the enrichment. The lower the enrichment, the cheaper the fuel. The higher the enrichment, they got a better, uh, better uh, feedback coefficient. Okay, I'm gonna just briefly go through some lessons and then I'm gonna talk about what, what uh, these lessons mean for today. Uh, there was no modern day containment, especially over the entire primary. The reactor core was not self-controlling. Higher powers tended to make the power go higher. The core was large and hard to control. Computers were needed. Operators had a hard time controlling the core. They needed computers to position all these control rods, and they were very slow. And they did not analyze a lot of different accidents. We have regulations in this country that require extensive safety analyses of what can happen, uh, design basis accidents, but even severe accidents. <clears throat> they didn't understand the risk of operating at low powers. The operators, they had good intentions, but they were complacent. They didn't follow the procedures. They were at night, not too many people around, so even if they did get in trouble, they didn't have a whole lot of people they could call on for help. What do we learn? Formality in the control room. Formal, don't have a lot of people in, don't have a lot of alarms lit, be quiet. It's a little, it's a little boring, but it's, that's the best thing to have in the control room, have a formal control room. 
safety reviews. Uh, one thing that the IAEA started after Chernobyl was a convention on nuclear safety. Every three years, all the nuclear countries get together and they have to write a report. It's basically a peer review. So uh, other countries get to ask you questions. So after Chernobyl, all the other countries around the world are, are able to ask the Soviet Union or you know, now new countries, well, what are you doing? How do you, how do you know your design and operation are safe? So they have to write a report and then they have to be grilled by their peers around the world. The IAEA is not a, a regulator, and the only thing that happens is happen voluntarily through treaties and states and countries agree to these treaties, in this case, the Convention on Nuclear Safety. One of the things that international operating experience to learn from the mistakes of others, after Three Mile Island, we set up the industry set up what's called, in this country, INPO, Institute for Nuclear Power Operations, to learn from each other. And after Chernobyl, INPO has expanded internationally uh, to the World Association of Nuclear Operations. And WANO conducts peer reviews uh, with the invitation of the country, but WANO conducts peer reviews to compare. And they'll take plant managers and and uh, maintenance and designers from different countries and go to a, a, another country and do an assessment and, and give the feedback. Emergency response. Why did, as Ed indicated, a lot of the radioactivity was identified in Scandinavia first? Why did we have to learn about this from Scandinavia? Workers were sent into life-threatening high radiation areas. They didn't need to. And they, some of the utility officials didn't promptly inform the public. And of course, even some of the workers were to discuss the fact that they disseminated false information. What lesson can we learn for emergency response? To have plans, plan for a, a, a problem, plan for an accident. Operators, the people operating the plant, need to exercise with the authorities, with local responders, and with the regulator. This is what we do in this country. We have exercise emergency response drills. Uh, promptly disseminate the information and provide frequent updates. Conduct frequent exercises to work the bugs out. There's always going to be problems with the phones. There's always going to be problems with communication. I guarantee you. So the best thing is to just keep training and conducting exercises and drills. You can do part. They don't have to all be with the, the state and the local officials, but continue to, to run the uh, communications drills. And make sure that you know where, where you're sending people into if there's an accident, into a high radiation area. Those people need to be protected. There were some positive things. They used potassium iodide. I think Ed mentioned that the evacuation of Pripyat was uh, fairly organized. They didn't panic in that evacuation. And one thing I, I've noticed that that Soviet Union era, they had a lot of medical people to treat the, the people that were received uh, excessive radiation. So I think I would say they had a extensive medical treatment Okay, for today, we're designing, the, this country and other countries are designing new nuclear power plants, small modular reactors, traveling wave reactors, fast neutron reactors, floating nuclear power plants. I served on a floating nuclear, uh, <laughs> floating nuclear power plant on two of them. Uh, my question is, are they going to have containments? Containments that we have in this country are reinforced concrete, three feet thick, with a steel liner. So think about it. Are all the new small modular reactors we're designing today, are they going to have uh, adequate containments? Uh, all the new fuel designs. Are they going to have stable reactivity coefficients? 
are they analyzed for beyond design basis accidents? And what about rising sea? I'll show you a picture at the end here. Uh, climate change. Are the designs that are, the plants that are being designed today, are they being designed for the future with rising sea levels? Operations. Uh, training. Training. No matter how smart the operators are, they still need to be trained frequently. They need to uh, use the procedures that they have, people have designed for them. After Three Mile Island, we required the, the technology, the vendors, Westinghouse, GE, Babcock, and Wilcox, to get more involved in, in helping the utilities with a, a, a designer-centric set of emergency procedures. The designers weren't going to be there during the accident, but we wanted them to go back and revalidate the basis for all the emergency procedures. Uh, safety reviews and management oversight. IAEA will send an operational safety review team to, to as long as they have the people. I think they're doing 10 this year around the world, but they have to be asked for. They have to be requested by the country and the utility, and WANO will also do peer reviews. Prepare for severe accidents. After Fukushima, the NRC in this country decided they needed to look at beyond design basis earthquakes and flooding to see how close the original designs were to what we started to see. We've seen new earthquakes shaking the uh, George Washington Monument and the National Cathedral here. And the power plant in Virginia, closest, uh, not Calvert Cliffs, but the one at North Anna, saw an earthquake that was beyond their design basis. So are these new designs, are these new designs uh, taking into account uh, more severe accidents than the original plants were designed? Emergency response. I, I don't need to go into too much more. I do want to mention in 1987, so that was one year after Chernobyl, uh, a regulator in Sweden, Mr. Lars Holberg, he recommended review of multi-unit sites. And I note now, so we're 30 years later, that was one of the lessons learned from Fukushima. And of course, after 9-11, uh, when I was in the NRC during 9-11, so I know we, we required new uh, uh, design and operational requirements on nuclear power plants uh, to protect against the severe terrorist attacks, fires and explosions. And the question is, how does that relate to emergency response if there is an accident and a, a terrorist activity on a nuclear power plant? How is that, is that being taken into account in the emergency <coughs> response exercises and plans? It, it is, I know it is in this country, but I don't know about all the countries. Uh, transparency. I know that uh, a lot of new nuclear power plants are being built in China and in India and in Russia and around the world. Some of these are designs that are hard to find information about, uh, transparency. A lot of this is proprietary information, but the regulators in those countries will be reviewing that, but I don't know how much information is available. Some of these designs, it's very hard to get real details of the design. What is the basis for some of those decisions? And the, the last thing I want to mention is the independence of the regulator. In, in some countries, the IAEA will indicate that the regulatory agency is not as independent as it should be. And that was one of the lessons from, this is the International Nuclear Safety Advisory Group, which is a group of outside uh, experts that advise the IAEA, uh, Dick Mazur from the U.S., the former NRC chairman, was on uh, head of the INSAG recently, and their, one of their subsequent reports after the Chernobyl accident was the regulator 
did not function as an independent component in ensuring safety in Chernobyl. And this is, this is still a lesson today. We have a lot of new countries, new countries that want nuclear power. Poland, Egypt, Turkey, Vietnam, the United Arab Emirates. And so the question is, where are they going to put their resources? Certainly they're going to think about the expensive nuclear power plant, but the, my question is, are they going to uh, put some resources into having a good independent regulatory agency? Okay, the last slide I will show is, these are my references. Does anybody know where this nuclear power plant is? Has anybody seen this picture before? Nebraska. Pardon me? Nebraska. Yes, this is Nebraska. This is Nebraska. So, uh, I never realized, you know, I've never lived in an area where a river could flood so much, but uh, this is really, uh, to me, a message about design and siting and uh, climate change. And so, if, if you believe what the scientists tell us, the sea level is going to rise. And so are the new plants being designed uh, to handle, uh, this is a river of course, mm -hmm. but uh, the rivers flow <laughs> into the ocean. So mm -hmm. I think some of these new plant designs, uh, besides the internals of the containment, certainly and the core and the operations, we also need to take into effect uh, the future changes in climate in my talk is sort of the history of the first 20 years after Chernobyl when, in my mind, we learned so much and hopefully we will be the wise ones learning from the experiences of others. In fact, Chernobyl changed the nuclear industry forever. It was undeniably the worst accident and it really made um, a complete change in philosophy and thinking about who should be responsible for safety. As you already heard, there was a new focus on reactors on design and that they were safe. Industry created a new organization, the World Association of Nuclear Operators. These are the operators themselves from the reactors going and inspecting each other as a step, separate step from the regulator to make sure that they're doing the right thing, to make sure they're sharing information between them because an accident at one reactor or even an incident could happen at another reactor of a totally different design and you need to know about that. It changed international law it created four new conventions. It changed the role of the IAEA. The IAEA is a non-proliferation organization. It was created to make sure that people in countries didn't use their nuclear facilities for military and purposes. All of a sudden, after Chernobyl, the international community went to the IAEA and said, we need your help. We need you to start looking at safety. This was an extraordinary change because before this, everyone in the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, et cetera, happened to be at NRC, that's how I know, at this time, believed that this had to be a national responsibility. You had to follow it so closely that it couldn't be done internationally, but <coughs> something had to be done internationally after Chernobyl. This was so remarkable that it got the G7 heads of state attention for over a decade. And I know that because I was pulled out of a job and I was asked to go help prepare for the G7 summit of 1992 when the United States introduced the idea of it was important for the advanced international economies of the G7 to help the former Soviet countries with reactor safety. Why was this? This was because all of these facilities were built by Russians, managed by Russians, operated out of 
uh, directions that came out of Moscow. After the fall of the wall in Berlin, after the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, these reactors were all now owned by different countries. They were run by countries that had no tradition in operating nuclear facilities, with one exception. That was Czechoslovakia, because the Spoda facility there was doing nuclear um, construct, uh, manufacturing. So the G7 heads were desperately concerned that there could be another Chernobyl. And we needed to get people from our regulatory authorities involved and our operating um, authorities involved. And so for the US, the Department of Energy and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, in coordination with the State Department, became the US um, team that helped in the G7 process. Another remarkable change, international financial institutions, the World Bank, uh, the Asian Development Bank, the European Development Bank, these were places where you didn't do nuclear. There was one nuclear project done in 1962 in Brazil, and since then, the international financial institutions view nuclear as too risky, not after Chernobyl. And finally, as was alluded to earlier, there were some very severe economic and social impacts in the region, but also in other areas where these reactors exist. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. I think we've heard a lot about it at this. Just to say that because of the concern about the Soviet designed reactors, we morphed in the mid 1990s into a review of the safety of all reactors in all countries. The Asians set up their own nuclear safety working group, Europeans had their own safety uh, working group. Mostly these were teams of regulators who were looking together now at the reactors under their purview to see what they could learn from each other. This is inside the RBMK you saw before the control room. Those are guys walking on the reactor head. That's what was blown out uh, in the accident. The new industry role was quite interesting because INPO had really changed the way the industry looked at itself. INPO's whole purpose was, we're going to catch ourselves before the regulators catch us. We're going to make sure that we don't have any problems so the regulators can't find any. That idea was so positive in the United States that the head of the Department of Energy in 1989 went to some of his colleagues in INCO and said, what can we do about this? We've got to expand this. That was Secretary Watkins, by the way. And uh, the World Association of Nuclear Operators was created with four locations. Notice Atlanta. Atlanta is because of INPO, which is in Atlanta. And London, Moscow, and Tokyo. The idea, again, is that operators keep each other informed, and they do peer reviews. These are non-governmental. These guys will not talk to you if you're in the government. They talk to each other, and they're very, very hard on each other. The peer pressure is extraordinary because if there's an accident anywhere, we now know it's going to affect everybody. Here are the four conventions that came out of Chernobyl. As you can imagine, the first one was notification of accidents. Mm. You can't do this again. You can't not tell the world if you have an accident. And uh, mm. 1987, it only took a few months before this convention was written and on the books at the IAEA. Second was, look, this is a problem for everybody who should be providing assistance. And so there was a convention written again and passed in a very short period of time with the IAEA as a clearinghouse. Government sent in information of the kinds of things they could do to help somebody else who had a reactor accident. We talked about the Convention on Nuclear Safety, but I have to say two things about it. It first and foremost made safety first a requirement across the international community and that that was the operator's responsibility. It was not anybody else, it was the operator. But second, it made sure that every country recognized it had to have a regulator 
who was independent and fully financed so they could do their job. Last was an interesting uh, impact. The uh, Chernobyl accident obviously didn't stay within boundaries. It affected many countries. There was a lot of damages from that. And you can imagine that you weren't going to get the Soviet Union to pay for that. So it raised concern about what if there's another major accident? How do we compensate victims of these? The United States at the time was not a member of the Vienna Convention on Nuclear Liability, which had been brought into effect in 1963 at the IAEA, nor the Paris Convention, um, which was done by the European countries. So we started an effort to create a broader umbrella um, liability convention that did something unusual, supplementary compensation. And what the idea was here was that other countries, in the event of an accident, would be taxed to help pay for everybody's, uh, sorry, for another country's um, accident. It was a very interesting concept to bring to the international community, but they bought it. And within a year and a half, we had a new convention, and I'm happy to say it only took until this year, um, but it is now in effect. Um, a convention or a treaty does not go into effect until a certain number of countries have signed on to it so that it really makes sense that it is now international law. And this year, Canada and Japan joined along with the United States, and there it now is in effect. The IAEA's role. Uh, right after, as someone else mentioned, INSAC was created to advise the Director General of the IAEA, because the IAEA didn't do nuclear safety. That wasn't their job. And so the Director General said, I'm, I'm going to need some help. He brought in this nuclear safety advisory group, and they um, advised him in preparation for the first meeting with the Soviet Union on Chernobyl, which, as you heard, didn't go very well. Uh, in 1991, so several years later, uh, the first of the concerns about those Eastern Europe Soviet design reactors, and the IAEA was asked to send a safety review mission to Bulgaria to the cause of the reactor. The team that went there found the most appalling conditions. Trash all over everywhere. Uh, anybody could walk in. Anybody could go into various parts of the facilities. There was no sense of how critical and special this technology was, that it had to be protected, and that you had to do things um, with, with much more clarity and respect for the technology. Finally, a few years later, uh, the IAEA was so engaged by this, and particularly the Nuclear Safety Convention responsibilities, that it created its own department of nuclear safety. Uh, sorry, the IAEA doesn't do anything by itself. It has a board of governors. Of all of the governments, there's actually over 133 something. Almost every government actually is a member of the IAEA, and it's those governments who told the IAEA we'll pay for a department of safety. Then, as we noted earlier um, from John's discussion, operational safety review teams were started, integrated regulatory reviews, and nuclear safety culture reviews. The IAEA would create a group pulled from all of our various countries. They would go to a site once the country had agreed and the power plant had agreed that they could come to visit. Now, needless to say, there was a little bit of peer pressure. You need to have one of these. I remember the US getting peer pressure to have an OSAR admission. Um, it's very much a building of confidence uh, among the rest of the international community that you have good, safe operations. The IAEA safety standards and guides were upgraded, and now they became um, not the basis for regulating, as you still had to have your regulations, 
um, in keeping with their national laws and policies, but they became much more an element of how do you do a regulation for safety. Nuclear safety culture, I don't know if this picture is visible. This is one of the lava flows coming out of the melt from Chernobyl accident. And this is the guy who's trying to get electrocuted, who's doing some <laughs> welding over wow. there. Guy, this man is still alive. <laughs> um, and uh, not doing so great, but he's still alive. And as he said, he still drinks beer. Um, <laughs> The nuclear safety culture was really um, a vastly more important subject after Chernobyl. Three Mile Island got us started thinking about the fact that operators didn't have this safety culture, but my goodness, after Chernobyl, um, particularly because the government was the owner. They're not private facilities in, in the former Soviet countries that are owned by the governments. And that meant that the government had to establish the safety cultures and also strengthen the regulatory authority. Sadly, the Russian regulatory authority is still not in effect. Um, they carried out training missions, tra training and missions by both the IAEA and WANO. The IAEA and WANO work very closely together so they don't show up in the same countries in the same year, etc. cetera. Uh, regulatory authorities set requirements for nuclear safety culture. You can read the NRC's um, regulations on this. And after Fukushima, just this last February, the, the feeling became, again, that it was time for the international community to say, again, have we become too complacent? And there was a major conference on safety culture at the IAEA. Emergency preparedness, uh, international emergency preparedness. Yes, the U.S. changed. In fact, I was at the State Department at Chernobyl time, and the Federal Emergency Response Plan for Radiological Accidents was changed to add the State Department and our embassies because if you had an accident in another country, you had to get the American citizens out. That's part of the State Department and this responsibility. And uh, so they needed to be a part of the team. They also were able to provide information um, until communications became so much better than they are like today, um, from the countries themselves to the NRC and the Department of Energy. So they were, at that point, uh, we have computers, I think, on our desk, but maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, the IAEA became um, another central clearinghouse for emergency response. They set up an international um, response center. They um, became, uh, they set up this uh, pyramid of what is an accident um, in terms of severity. And in particular, this helped to establish what kinds of uh, emergency response was required. He was to say that's Chernobyl right up there at the top. The G7 heads, as I said, it started in 1992. This was just after the Soviet Union was dissolved. The concern was, again, that these reactors were not going to be well secured. The uh, G7 goal was, okay, we're going to go out and we're going to improve the safety of these reactors, and if we can't do that, we're going to encourage these countries to close them. A nuclear safety working group was established, and for the U.S., that was composed of DOE, NRC, and State Department folks. And we worked with our counterparts in the G7 countries and the European Commission to put together a series of assistance programs which ended up to be several billion dollars worth of assistance, uh, not just to upgrade reactors, although primarily the money was for that, but also to train, to train regulators, to train operators, uh, to make sure that the whole concept of safety was um, being brought to all of the players in these countries. The uh, G7 took on Chernobyl as a special assignment. Um, I know Ed noted that it was 2000 that the last reactor closed in Chernobyl. 
That was because of a memorandum of understanding that the G7 undertook with Ukraine. If you oppose Chernobyl by the year 2000, which we started in 94, then we will help ensure that you can afford to oppose Chernobyl. Chernobyl was the uh, cheapest source of electricity in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So closing it, particularly when it provided power to Kiev, was not on uh, from the Ukrainian standpoint. The other thing that uh, it would require, since it provided electricity to Kiev, was a replacement. And Ukrainians didn't have that money in the post-Soviet era, which meant they were going to have to get a loan. They didn't know what a loan was. They didn't know what a grant was. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget having a conversation with the head of the environment ministry, who had been given a responsibility in Ukraine for this, explaining to him what a loan was, what a grant was, <laughs> that you had to pay back a loan. No, you didn't have to pay back a grant. <laughs> they had never run into these terms because everything had been just doled out through the government's budget. Mm -hmm. Uh, in uh, 1996, the G7 decided to take on Russia on nuclear safety and called a G8, this is before the G8 existed, a G8 Nuclear Safety and Security Summit. This uh, gentleman right here is Mr. Yeltsin, next to the President Clinton. The new role for the international financial institutions really fell to the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development because it was established to manage the Eastern European countries and the economic and other problems that they faced now as independent countries. The Nuclear Safety Account was established. This was a focal point for the uh, work to improve the safety of the reactors in these countries. Um, it got quite a bit, a um, couple hundred million dollars from the G7 to the rest of Japan uh, to provide um, for what were agreed um, uh, improvements for these reactors with a very careful no improvements at reactors that should be shut down like Chernobyl. Uh, the EBRB took on the Chernobyl Sarcophagus Project um, which began in 1997 with a team of Americans and European Commission experts uh, trying to figure out what are we going to do with this thing. And in 1997, Vice President Gore and President Kuchma held a, a chaired an international pledging conference to raise the first tranche of money, which is now I gather we're on number five. Um, energy sector reform. What does this have to do with Chernobyl? Well, if you're going to get a loan, you've got to pay for electricity. In the Soviet Union, electricity was free. Nobody paid for it. And so how do you convince the public that they have now lost their political structure, lost their economic support, and now they're going to have to pay for electricity? Well, this was absolutely critical to any loans being given to these countries. And, uh, it fell on the EBRB with a little help from the World Bank to try and implement energy sector reform. If it had been successful, new reactors would have been built by the EBRB in Ukraine, but it just never quite got to the point of regularity that they could depend on revenue enough to pay back the loan. This is the new safe confinement about to be rolled into place in 19, uh, sorry, in 2017. <laughs> you can see the reactors behind it, so they're just going to shove it down. Um, it's an aluminum, I understand. Cool. Um, last couple points, economic and social impacts. There is no question, if you look at the countries that are in worse shape still, in the former Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. They are those with these old reactors. They're Bulgaria, they're, uh, they're Ukraine, Armenia. Uh, those are also the ones with the closest relationships to Russia. The impact of closing these reactors was huge, economically and socially. As you heard earlier, there were an enormous amount of people who were evacuated 
from the Chernobyl region. But their jobs were Chernobyl. There were four reactors there. There were thousands of people who were put out of work just like that. Um, they all lived in this town, Slobodich, and the question was, how do you get these guys who are far away, really from the city center of Kiev, work? And so one of the things we did with the EC is create a social impact plan. We helped them develop a business incubator in the town of Slobodich to try and get small businesses developing um, in the area so there would be some way that they could make money. Thank you. <laughs> Carol, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to begin with a voice from Chernobyl back then. This is from this extraordinary book called Voices from Chernobyl by Svetlana Alexeyevich, who won the Pulitzer, uh, uh, rather the Nobel for this. And she is, as you may know, a journalist, I guess primarily from Belarus. I think. So this is, this is Nikolai Kaligan, who is a cleanup worker and lived in the town of Pripyat heard about the scene before, and he says, you know, well, there you are one day, you're a normal person, just like everyone else, and suddenly Chernobyl happens, and you're turned into a Chernobyl person. And he goes on to say, people turn like you're some strange animal and ask you questions. Was it scary? Did you see the fire? Can you still have children? Um, and he said, Chernobyl becomes like a signal to everyone. They turn and look at you and say, he's from there. So that's one voice from Chernobyl. Um, here's a, a, something that you may have seen many times yourself. Um, Chernobyl, as you know, was quite extraordinary in that given wind, rain, and other conditions, the plume really affected virtually all of Europe and parts of Russia. But here are the most heavily affected areas, which not surprisingly are in the northern part of Ukraine near where the reactor was and north in Belarus, particularly the area around Gomel, and obviously here's the part of uh, Western Russia also affected. Um, unlike, for instance, in Japan, where exposure was to external gamma radiation, which affects the bone marrow, um, the, the principal component of Chernobyl fallout with radioactive iodine, um, iodine-131, concentrates in the thyroid. So the thyroid dose is many, many times higher than doses to any other organ. And its principal source is contaminated milk. Um, and the result was doses were highest in children, first because they have a very small thyroid, so for the same level of exposure, they'll get a higher dose. And they also drink a lot of milk. And um, this is an illustration of the principal exposure pathway from the pasture to the cow to the milk to the child. So thinking about Chernobyl then and now, what was known then? What was the context for this accident? Well, it was well known that external radiation, whether it was environmental or medical, did cause an increase in thyroid cancer and exposed children. But I-131, which was used principally in clinical setting to treat hyperthyroidism, um, um, there are many studies, including a very large one from Sweden, like 37,000 uh, patients that showed no increase in thyroid cancer. Of course, these were all adults, and there were very little data on children. So at the time of the accident, um, I-131 was considered to have no to low carcinogenicity. And it's not surprising in that context that the countermeasures against I-131 were very limited. We heard that the announcement of the accident wasn't made until two to three days later, so sheltering was not a possible countermeasure. Um, there were some evacuations, some of them planned, some voluntary, um, but the distribution of potassium iodide, which uh, prevents uptake, it blocks radioiodine, was simply not done systematically. Um, as a result, it actually took this letter in Molasset in 1991 by Dr. Kordajnik, who happens to be a long-term collaborator of ours at NCI, um, where he, he showed that after many, many years of, of zero thyroid cancer in children, in 1990, there were three cases. Um, and this got a lot of attention. 
people were skeptical because at the time the dogma was that the minimum latency period for onset of thyroid cancer was more like five years. But this was followed by this um, illustration or in, in publication, um, which showed that uh, the increases in 1990 happened in both Ukraine and in Belarus and principally in the Gomel area. So even though people sort of said, well, this is just the result of uh, detection bias, people are doing screening and they're finding these thyroid cancers, the fact that they were more so in Gomel where there actually was um, a good bit of contamination led to um, some notion that this was worth studying seriously. And this is a case control study um, cut it carried out in Belarus by um, NCI and some Belarusian uh, collaborators. Um, and it was based on a rather small number of, of young thyroid cancer cases. But it showed quite clearly you get more than twofold at this next exposure level. And at one gray, it's up to sixfold, even though based on rather small numbers. Um, Another sort of contextual factor to the accident is that Belarus and um, <coughs> Ukraine are both iodine deficient. They have low levels of iodine. And when in conditions of iodine deficiency, you get much more uptake of radioiodine. <coughs> iodine. So this was a study that actually tried to look at this issue by um, comparing those with low levels of solar si soil iodine and no use of potassium iodide in comparing their risk, which the odds ratio is many times higher than those in this category who were both taking KI and also living in areas with reasonable levels of stable iodine. Um, but perhaps the most extensive studies of this issue were done by NCI in 26,000 children, that is, those who were exposed before the age of 18 in Ukraine and Belarus, mean doses of you know, about a half a gray or more, and who were screened uh, seriously about every few years for thyroid disease using not only palpation but also ultrasound. And the importance of this is that some of the time trends which I sh showed you earlier, it was suggested that this could just be, again, improved level of surveillance and you're just picking it up. But here, um, all of the children are screened completely regardless of dose. So the findings that we have, and I'm just showing you one here, um, this is for prevalent cases of thyroid cancer in Ukraine at the time of the first screening. There were about 45 cases. And you could see that there's quite a strong linear dose response um, and a five-fold increased risk for these children. And our other studies, um, and those by others, also find um, a consistent two to five-fold excess, the greatest in those who were youngest at the time of exposure. And the risk, I'm sorry to say, remains elevated decades later. And this is similar to what's happened in Japan. And um, the magnitude of the excess is very similar to what has been seen with external radiation. But the findings in multiple studies are not consistent in terms of whether iodine deficiency really does act to increase the risk of exposure to radioiodine. Post-Chernobyl cancers have a very characteristic histology. They're papillary thyroid cancers. But here is the classic form. And those post-Chernobyl are of a solid subtype. And these um, occur. Uh, it, younger ages, the shorter latency, and they're much more aggressive. So these were not good thyroid cancers, even though part of the debate that goes on about you know, the effects of Chernobyl, people say, oh yes, it's thyroid cancer, but it's treatable, you know, it's not a serious condition, and so forth. These were very aggressive thyroid cancers that these kids got. Um, I'm not going to talk about this at all, but I just wanted you to know that this is also going on. In addition to concerns about the thyroid cancer phenotype, everybody's concerned about genomics as well. So at NCI, currently, we're doing a survey of genetic changes using whole genome sequencing to look at de novo mutations and mini satellite mutations, which, by the way, have been reported 
in children born post Chernobyl in that area, um, and also radiation somatic genetic events. Um, now I want to turn to another radiosensitive population. We've talked about young children who are um, sensitive because of their small thyroids and so forth. And now I want to turn to the embryo and fetus. Obviously a very small thyroid, but also very fast, quickly uh, dividing cells. And um, at the end of the first, whoops, no, did we begin? Okay, the end of the first trimester, when the <coughs> fetal thyroid is fully active, uptake is very rapid from the maternal circulation, and they end up with levels many fold higher than in the maternal thyroid. So we wanted to look at this, whether or not we would see increased thyroid cancer, and perhaps even a, a greater increase in this group. So we have um, an ongoing study in Ukraine with collaborators at the Institute for Endocrinology and Metabolism of about 2,600 mother-child pairs. Their mean fetal dose is 72 milligrams, um, which is not in, unsubstantial, and they go up to over three grams. So they were screened for thyroid cancer 2003-2006 and we found eight neoplasias, seven cancers, one triple cell. And the estimated odds ratio is very strong. It's almost 12-fold, um, but not statistically significant because of the small number of cases, presumably, at least that contributes. So this is a suggestive finding which needs confirmation. And at the moment, we're constructing a similar, a parallel cohort in Belarus and um, we will do the same thing. They will also be screened and we'll see whether or not uh, we get this. Uh, because there's always been an ongoing debate about whether or not those exposed prenatally have a, a, a stronger response to radiation than those with postnatal exposure. So we see, interesting. Um, and here I'm gonna report on some very sort of, um, how shall I say, inadequate literature. This is moving from thyroid cancer to leukemia. And, um, but for the in utero exposed group, there has been an initial report, uh, first from Greece, which was also um, had some level of contamination. But then there were uh, subsequent studies in Germany and Belarus and so forth that did not find any relationship with contamination level. But there is still some interest in whether, you know, as I said, whether or not in utero exposed in, uh, individuals are at increased risk not only for thyroid but also for leukemia. Um, and then in terms of uh, those exposed in childhood, whether they get childhood leukemia, unfortunately the studies are so flawed that uh, we can't really say anything about that today. That's a big gap in knowledge, clearly. But I did want to show you this. Um, these are our two cohorts from Ukraine and Belarus, these exposed in childhood and adolescence. And um, Jenya Ostromova and I did studies looking at uh, the standardized incidence ratio in these two areas. Unfortunately, as you can see, the numbers are very small, partly because we didn't have complete follow-up. But in both cases, the SIR is elevated above one, both times, um, not statistically significant but I think it's something that bears watching. So what do we know now? We know that I-131 does increase risk of papillary thyroid cancer among those exposed in early life, that the effect of low dose in utero early life exposure on hematopoietic processes like leukemia is uncertain, and that unfortunately there are very few reliable data on adverse reproductive outcomes. I haven't mentioned that at all, but we have a study ongoing right now of that cohort in Ukraine, the 2600, where we went and reviewed their prenatal delivery and neonatal records, and uh, we have some very interesting findings which will be presented and published shortly. Now I wanted to turn to this other group, um, the cleanup workers. You can see from this photograph, maybe even from a distance, there were 600,000 of them who were sent, and many of them were boys, I mean, just young kids. You know? um, they were called liquidators because their mission was to liquidate the consequences of the accident, 
And I think many of you are very familiar with these figures, that the two plant workers died in the immediate aftermath, and that those who received high external radiation doses um, that resulted in an acute radiation syndrome, there were 134, who got ARS, and uh, 29 near-term deaths. So we've been studying a cohort of liquidators in Ukraine with collaborators at the Research Center for Radiation Medicine. It's about 110,000 of them sent between 1986 and 1990. They were all less than 60, and they were sent by various military civilian groups, did all kinds of tests, exposed mainly to external radiation with a mean dose of about 100 milligrams. So our study initially focused on leukemia um, because the bone marrow is very radiosensitive. Um, and the highest risk for unit dose of external radiation among all radiation-induced cancers is for leukemia. And it has the shortest latency, which made it possible to see, uh, to observe cases. So the case control study had about 137 cases and multiple controls per case. Um, this is sort of to let you know how, how difficult it is to do what's called retrospective research because these started about 10 years later, but the dosimetry records were poor, missing for a no large number of subjects. So we developed together with IARC a whole new method of estimating dose called, it's a time and motion method. I'll just very quickly, you can see through a questionnaire, we asked where were you, what did you do? We know we have a database of exposure rates, and we estimate exposure and ultimately bone marrow, marrow density doses and their uncertainty. So these, this is the result of our study. And it's interesting because it addresses the issue of fractionation, because these men received, like mainly men, in our cohort they were all males, they weren't all males in the cleanup worker world, um, that Fractionated dose, like the protracted sort of chronic doses these men receive, ought to reduce risk, right? That's why we do it in the clinical set setting, to fractionate the dose. So it, to some extent, it was a bit surprising to find that there was very significant linear dose response for all leukemias. And perhaps even more surprisingly, we found when we looked, broke it down into subtypes, um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which had traditionally been considered non-radiogenic, um, had an elevated excess odds ratio, um, as did the grouping of non-CLL leukemias. So just to put this into context, to let you sort of know the, um, I don't know, the reverberations from these findings, we found that the risk from low dose, low dose rate exposure is comparable to that from the A-bomb survivors with acute exposure. So the whole fractionation issue is an open deal at the moment. And we also found, as I said, the elevated risk for both CLL and non-CLL. And this is consistent with another study of another group of liquidators by IR, but is still, I would say, not completely accepted in all areas of the radiation world. There are still experts like John Boyce who feel very strongly that CLL is not a radiogenic cancer. So we also are looking at thyroid cancer in early liquidators because in addition to external radiation, those who were there early on the scene got some inhalation exposure to I-131. And there have been a series of three prior studies that have found um, some increased risk. This is one again by Dr. Krujajna who spells his name differently in different times. <laughs> An eight-fold increase, very strong, in male recovery workers. And then at IARC again, their group, they found increased risk in males uh, for thyroid cancer, also higher in females. Um, the males not only had inhalation exposure, but many of them lived close to the site, and so they went home and they ingested contaminated food. And then, um, Eugenia Ostromova found an elevated st uh, standardized incident ratio of th three times what the uh, null level would be for those who went on a first cleanup mission in 1986. She also found elevations for those who went later, but the greatest elevation was 
for those who were there early. Um, now, there are some non-cancer effects that are notable as well. Um, Boris uh, Wargel, the, the, the late Dr. Wargel from Columbia, found cataracts in a uh, liquidator cohort from Ukraine at one gray when the previous dose threshold was considered to be five gray. And as a result of that study, there have been modifications made in the exposure limit. But another finding which would have enormous ramifications for radiation protection is whether or not there is an increase in cerebrovascular disease. Um, Victor Ivanov in the Russian Federation found an increase at more than 150 milligray. But that's a pretty high dose, you know, that wouldn't be anything the general population would accrue. Um, and then there's breast cancer. Um, this is moving back to residents of contaminated regions in Belarus and Ukraine. And the breast, like the bone marrow and the thyroid, is very radiosensitive. So um, this study was carried out and found that those at the highest exposure level um, were at increased risk. Uh, twofold for all women, and then the subgroup who were exposed at uh, you know sort of premenopausal ages, uh, threefold increase. And um, although the numbers are reasonably small, I think there are about 37 here and 17 here. The finding was um, for metastatic disease, not just localized disease. So it was not thought to represent just an increase in detection. And um, uh, Scott Davis from the Fred Hutch is doing a big case control, very extensive case control study of breast cancer now in Russia, in the Russian Federation, taking tumor tissue and so forth. It's going to really look at all the issues. I should go back. I want to say one more comment about this. Because one of the reasons there's a question mark here is that somebody mentioned before, this study was done without any accounting for what's called confounding variables like smoking and obesity in the population and so forth. So that's another reason for the question. Um, and so finally, the question of psychological consequences. This is a summary slide that represents work by Evelyn Gromit and her Ukrainian collaborator, Johan Havanar, over a series of years. And um, they found in liquidators depression and PTSD still elevated decades later, with severity of exposure being sort of the main risk factor for liquidators. And also mothers of young children, a very high risk group for depression, anxiety, and PTSD, mainly because of concerns about their children or future children. And also, um, uh, unfortunately, a very inconsistent <coughs> findings on the question of cognitive <coughs> neuropsych effects in exposed children. Some studies find things, other people studies don't. There have been studies done in Scandinavian populations as well, mainly positive, but Evelyn and Johan's work generally negative. Um, and I don't have an honest lie, but there have also been surveys in which the general population <coughs> reports that well low levels of well-being um, and so forth. So some people are um, concluding that psychological consequences are, are the most severe health effect of the Chernobyl accident. But I feel after going through the material that I've reviewed for you today, that that's not so obvious to me. I think the somatic health consequences are somewhat substantial as well. But everyone can have their own opinion. So now I'd like to talk about um, where we need to do some further research. One is the question, as I mentioned before, of leukemia in those exposed in early life, thyroid cancer in those exposed as adults. In general, it's been the, the data from Japan showed that the increased risk was lower, the higher the age at exposure, so the general belief was that the adult thyroid wasn't as sensitive, but being not as sensitive is the same as being insensitive, so we, NCI is doing a study now of thyroid cancer in our liquidator cohort. <laughs> Breast cancer in males as well as females, because although there aren't really published data on it, you hear reports of excess male breast cancer among liquidators. And I've heard it from Belarus, right? So this, this bear is watching. 
And I mentioned that the Fred Hutch is doing the big breast cancer study, but in females. But I'm saying we should be looking in males, too. Also, other solid cancers with long latency that just haven't had a chance yet to appear. CVD, I mentioned, a major concern. We need to know more about that. Um, okay, am I over? Transgenerational effects. One more minute? Okay, this, um, I'm almost there. Um, and this is the issue of whether parental radiation exposure is going to end up affecting, you know, genetic changes in the children. We're doing a study of that as well. And continued work on mental health and well-being in the population. Um, so we have learned something. The safe release of I-131 in diagnosis and treatment. The need to consider mental health aspects and uh, have multidisciplinary studies. Risk communication is important and prompt countermeasures are critical. And here, thanks to Chernobyl, um, food restriction was in, put in place in Fukushima, so this whole capture cow, uh, uh, cow milk pathway was interrupted, and there were other countermeasures as well. And just a thought slide, a thinking slide, the socio-psychological impact of Chernobyl on populations in Ukraine and Belarus, identity politics, radiation, the invisible enemy, misinformation, mismanagement, ecological and socioeconomic disruption, restrictions on important social cultural practices like gathering berries and mushrooms, which are you know, which now discouraged because they concentrate radiation, and being referred to as Chernobyl victims. And there's a whole, you know, you sign up, you become a victim, you get certain um, health benefits and so forth. So the, there's real impact in that sense. Um, somebody was talking about these very variable estimates of sort of worldwide morbidity and mortality due to Chernobyl. And all I can conclude from this is that risk projection is very risky. <laughs> you just don't know where you are. So I want to end with a voice from Chernobyl. And this is a faculty member at Gomel University. I started wondering what's better, to remember or to forget. I've wondered why everyone was silent about Chernobyl, why our writers weren't writing much about it. They write about the war, the camps, but here they're silent. It goes on. Um, if we'd understood Chernobyl, it might have been different, but we don't know how to capture any meaning from it. We can't place it in our human experience or our human time frame. So what's better to remember or to forget? And I agree with Charles, as we're here today, because we want to remember and we've learned many things from it. Thank you for your time. So we have roughly 10 minutes or so for a formal Q&A. And uh, if you want to stay uh, after and continue the conversation, that's fine. Uh, we don't have this room forever, of course. Uh, we've run it for a certain period of time. But you're allowed to depart uh, at 4 PM uh, and, and go off uh, your own other busy lives. And But as Maureen said, and I, and I said in my opening remarks, I hope you do put this in your thoughts, and, and act as well. And I think all we've learned from our colleagues in the last hour and a half or so, very valuable information, lessons learned. And I also promised a colleague from the Embassy of Belarus, we're it's, it's a pleasure to have the Chargé d'Affaires here, uh, Pavlo Shavlovsky. Um, please, sir, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, a couple minutes to make some remarks. I appreciate a deep and honest analysis of uh, our esteemed experts. Uh, it is with uh, humility that I address this uh, distinguished audience as chief of mission of a country uh, which suffered most as a result of the Chernobyl accident 30 years ago. We received 70% of the radioactive fallout. 2.2 million people lived in affected areas and 20% of agricultural and 25% of forests were contaminated. The damage for Belarus was calculated at $235 billion, which is 32 state budgets at the time of the accident. And uh, uh, it would not be a mistake to say that uh, the disaster affected every single family in Belarus. And we will continue to feel the consequences of this terrible tragedy for centuries to come. Uh, over these 30 years, we have accumulated important and unique experience which we are always glad to share with our partners, also from the United States and 
in particular with the National Cancer Institute. We have implemented uh, on our own five-state programs and created efficiently functioning systems of health monitoring, social protection, agricultural and forestry management, radiation control, and uh, Chernobyl research. Uh, I'm proud to say that yesterday in Minsk we had a major international conference which was called uh, Chernobyl 30 years later from an emergency to the revival and sustainable social and economic development of the affected territories. Uh, the name of the event reflects a uh, new approach, new international approach to Chernobyl activity. And uh, it's also re reflected in the resolution of the conference, which reads that it is necessary to advance cooperation in Chernobyl areas to a new level after 2016 under the aegis of the UN. And uh, uh, UN Under Secretary General and uh, Administrator of UNDP was in Belarus to attend that conference. And maybe if I have a second, I will uh, ask a brief question to, uh, to Carol Kessler. Uh, according to you, do you think there is a future of uh, nuclear energy after Fukushima? Um, it is, I think, one of the biggest questions that the international community is asking itself, but I would say yes. I don't think it's going to happen as quickly as we thought it was before Fuku Fukushima. It is um, clear that there's been a slowing in several countries' um, interest in, in building new plants. But Asia is going ahead. And uh, China, India, uh, Vietnam, um, there's uh, other countries who are thinking about it seriously, Northern Africa, somewhat in the Middle East. So there is not... Um, any sense that probably was very shortly after Fukushima that maybe this would kill the nuclear energy interest. I don't think it's happened. It's just slowed it down. I also want to thank Mr. Shablovsky for such a, a nice uh, comments and speech. I'm glad you had that conference uh, yesterday in Minsk. Uh, Dave Hafemeister, and uh, you'll wait for the microphone. Please identify yourself. Dave Hafemeister from FAS. So if we're shutting down 20% of the grid, and we have to do it in a time-ordered way, of course, which do we do first, coal or nuke? And I'd like an answer. Ah, yeah. I think uh, John's, John wants to Rather than I answer, don't yeah. know. <laughs> you want to take a crack at that, John? Nuclear power is the safest industry in the United States. The only solution to global warming is safe nuclear power. I hope it does. I hope it does. I hope solar and wind get better, but the only solution is safe nuclear power. Oh, we're, ta we're going to do insta expert poll smart uh, the smart crowd uh, polling, huh? We, we could do that. Well, let's we can, uh, we'll see what time at the end, Dave, and then uh, let's go Milton Honig next, and then Tad Daly. Yeah, Milton Honig, uh, John, you mentioned that the operators were well intentioned. So I'm going to bring it to modern times. Uh, we could have a reactor explosion uh, by accident or by intention. Uh, you know, we're more NRC is of course always concerned about insiders and outsiders. If it's design basis threat, uh, it changes slowly. Not sure what it is right now, but still uh, there's an increased concern about uh, terrorist attacks, especially insiders. What uh, we have to be concerned about explosions uh, by accident at Chernobyl done by intent at modern day reactors. And I'll bring to your attention what happened in one of the reactors in uh, Belgium. Uh, <coughs> it was noted after the uh, two terrorist attacks recently by ISIS in Belgium. Namely, one of the reactors had uh, two workers who uh, went off to uh, work uh, to uh, serve with ISIS. One was killed, one is back in Belgium in prison. So this really puts the security question up front. Uh, security was, for, for nuclear reactors, for the first time taken up at the latest national security summit. So it really is a, a uh, current 
problem that has to be considered and uh, it is what I get out of looking at Chernobyl for today, namely the security issue, which is very important. Just one other, so this is a sort of a question when you think about that, one other point uh, on the safety issue, uh, be sort of a little facetious here maybe, but if Ronald Reagan were around in reference to the 11 operating RBMK reactors, he would say, Mr. Putin, shut down those <laughs> reactors. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, thank you, Milton. Anyone want to make a uh, comment to Milton's comments? Or? I think your point's well taken, Milton. Thank you so much. Uh, Tad Daly. Yeah, thank you, Charles. Uh, Tad Daly with the uh, Center for War Peace Studies in New York. Um, what a terrific event, uh, all of you. Uh, the ambassador from Belarus used the phrase centuries to come, and really all five of you really sort of persuaded me of, of that. That's what makes nuclear so different from so many other cataclysms is that the consequences last so long. Dr. Hatch, uh, my question is for you. Um, you talked about these liquidators, and I think you said uh, about 100,000 of them. Soviet yeah. Union wasn't a, sorry? No, 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 no. Oh, I'm and, sorry. And that studies. was just our cohort. There are you know, oh. 600,000. 600, yeah. uh, okay, 600, well, then my question's even more important. Okay. Uh, USSR wasn't a liberal democracy at that time, but neither was it a slave labor camp. Uh -huh. so, so who were these people? Were they ordered to go in? Were they d volunteers? You know, we'll pay you 20 rubles an hour. And, 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 and two more right. angles, if I may. Right. What were they told about the possible health consequences to them? And what are the protocols today for that particular uh, element, people who might have to go in to some kind of nuclear incident or accident? Well, I can't answer that part, but I've, uh, I'll say that they weren't told anything about the dangers ahead of them. And they were sent, some of them were military, some of them were, you know, yes, here, somebody's going to comment, do you know? Oh, oh. She's, she's lining up the next oh, question. Oh, right, next question, please okay. go ahead. Yeah. All right. Uh, so they came from all over, from and, and some of them, I guess, were volunteers, and they were given all sorts of different tasks that they didn't know. They, it was mainly they were sent. Any other co comments on that? Or oh, yeah, John. Yeah. Uh, in this country, we have fairly strict requirements, even in emergencies like this, a limit on what a worker can receive, a dose he can receive, to go in the plant to fix some equipment, and then another higher level for which uh, he's limited in order to save life. And these are practiced time and time again. We don't expect, we, we do not allow these kinds of reactors to operate in this country. And so we wouldn't expect this type of accident ever in this country. And the doses that we have seen, uh, example at uh, Three Mile Island, for the public and the workers were much lower than this. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. all the workers are trained in this country, all the emergency workers, and they conduct exercises with the state, the state usually the State Department of Radiological Health practices these exercises and the doses are well known and controlled. Uh, let's go to Florence Lowley. Florence Lowley, Global America Business Institute. This was just my curious question. Um, after Chernobyl, you said that what WANO was established, IMPO was created. It's a global um, gathering or global uh, output. But with this nuclear uh, accident, it's a local community. They are mostly been impacted. So is there like global standard or global gathering for a local government officials rather than just a federal and uh, international level? Uh, oh, yeah. um, if, if I understand what your question is, um, it has to do with are not just are there coordination efforts at the federal level, but are there more local mm -hmm. coordination efforts um, among people perhaps living near reactors? And uh, I would have to say that if there are, I w sorry, number one, I wouldn't be surprised if there are um, because of emergency planning efforts. Emergency planning has um, not come just out of nuclear incidents, but also, um, as we've seen in this country, hurricanes and other man uh, natural rather, th rather than man-made incidents. And in those cases, 
the local officials are in charge of responding to the emergency and the federal only help so my guess is that any local community around a reactor site has probably got an emergency plan in place and they work very closely with the plant on that right and, and that's why they're very well organized um, the emergency operating centers that are established for dealing with emergencies in areas where there are reactors, I'm sure they have plans to deal with an accident at the reactor. Because um, you're right, the, the plans are all done with the thinking that nobody from the federal government may get there for two or three days. So they have to be able to manage it locally. We're just about right at 4 p.m. official closing time, but I think if uh, you'll indulge us, we can take one or two more questions. I think uh, the gentleman right there in the, the white shirt and tie, please identify yourself. Thank you. I'm Leon Ratz from the Nuclear Threat Initiative. My question is about the international legal architecture uh, surrounding nuclear safety. And I'm wondering if you believe that it is uh, today, I mean, we have the four conventions that you talked about, Carol, you feel that today it adequately and effectively addresses nuclear safety, particularly given that we have all these nuclear newcomer countries uh, coming to nuclear energy in places like India, Bangladesh, UAE, where they have sa safety culture problems. Do you think that the international legal architecture is adequate to address some of those problems and some, some of those challenges up ahead? Thank you. I think it's certainly much better than it's ever been. Um, I think, though, with the newcomer countries, there is a very different situation that they face, and that is that they have to now make international commitments on nuclear safety that they've never, they, that wasn't the norm for many years. And uh, when the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA, works with these countries, one of the things that they do is immediately begin the discussions of these are the international conventions you have to join, the regulatory requirements you have to create, and, and that wasn't the norm even 10 years ago. Um, so I think uh, that's made a big difference. And second is the nuclear safety um, convention peer review groups that meet every three years that John was talking about, you don't have to have a reactor to go to that. And so countries show up um, and can hear about what the issues are at other in, in reactors in other countries. And so it's an educational opportunity, particularly if you're a country that's looking at um, nuclear. And the last point is the IAEA has established something called the 19 milestones. And these are, I guess, about two years old. There are 19 steps that any country interested in developing nuclear energy is encouraged to follow because, of course, IAEA can't require. But uh, this begins um, in terms of infrastructure development having a university that can train people to become your operators and your um, nuclear researchers and your regulators uh, so that you aren't like the UAE was very dependent on buying that expertise from other countries. The uh, Nuclear Regulatory Authority of the UAE is made up of ex-NRC officials who were bought not in the rudest sense of that word, but brought to the UAE to help them establish a regulatory authority that made that that had the enforcement capability. The uh, United Arab Emirates has a international advisory board that meets and publishes the results on the web on their website. You can read the reports. They have people from Japan, Korea, the United Kingdom. France, Finland, so it's a broad uh, international set of eyes and ears looking at their program. The head of the Federal Regulatory Agency right now is from Sweden.
so we have a we do have an international group in the united arab emirates but they also have uh, texas a and m helping them they have a university there that is providing uh, uh, nuclear training to their own uh, people their own nationals and the iaea has given the united arab emirates high marks they they have their reports uh, not every country gives IAEA the authority to release their reports. Some of them, even for the IAEA, are kept uh, proprietary, but the IAEA has told the IAEA they can release them. So I think one of the big uh, points that you all could think about is transparency as well as the funding for regulator, uh, regulatory agencies in countries like Startups. You mentioned Bangladesh and China and India. Uh, you can name all of them. The new new countries that want to have a nuclear power program, do they have an independent regulator, and is that regulator funded so that they can conduct their own inspections and licensing? That's a good parameter I would offer you to, to take a look. Great. Thank you all for your, your comments and questions. And we're just a little bit after four. So before letting you go, just a couple more points. Uh, next, I want to thank Allison Feldman and Peel Ulrich for uh, their great assistance for this event. This event would not have happened without the two of them and all the, all the good and hard work they put into this. And uh, I also want to thank FAS uh, supporters, donors, and members uh, for making these kinds of events possible. FAS wants to do more events. If you felt this was useful and valuable, uh, feel free to email me directly or call me or talk to me. You know, constructive criticism is welcomed as well. Any feedback, uh, let us know how we can uh, keep improving. And I really appreciate uh, your consideration of uh, helping support FAS uh, in the now and in the future. And uh, with that, uh, let me now finally turn to thanking our excellent presenters uh, all four of them, you know, I don't know about you, I think I know about you, and I certainly learned a lot from listening to them, and I'm hoping, and I didn't get permission ahead of time from them, that they can tell me if we have permission to put their slides up on our website so it's available, so that way you could study this information. We're also trying to produce a video of this event, too. We have a YouTube channel on, uh, for FAS, so we'll let you know when all of that is uh, ready as well. Please join me in thanking all our presenters.